Hello everyone. Welcome to Virtual Plant Science Day 2020. My name is Greg Bugby. I'm the principal investigator in the Invasive Aquatic Plant Program here at the Ag Station in New Haven. And myself and my associate Summer Stebbins are going to be talking to you today about invasive aquatic plants in Connecticut. And um, invasive aquatic plants are obviously plants that are um, uh, invasive, meaning they are not native to the state of Connecticut. They've come in from some other place, usually uh, Eurasia or South America or even southern parts of the United States. Uh, and they can do severe harm. This is a picture of Squance Pond, uh, which is a, uh, up in, uh, in the Danbury area. Um, and uh, you can see uh, this is a year where the invasive aquatic plants have been controlled versus a year where they have not been controlled. And you can see the drastic differences and imagine what um, the people who live along this lake and others who want to use it uh, must be thinking when they see this. And when they see this, they want some answers and our Invasive Aquatic Plant Program is trying to give them the answers. So this is going to be a two-part um, description today of the invasive aquatic plants in Connecticut. Uh, the first part I will uh, narrate, and it has to do with the invasive aquatic plant program, the condition of the state, uh, how we control invasive aquatic plants. The second part will be given by Summer Stebbins, and she's going to be talking about the individual aquatic plants, how do we, how we identify them, what they look like, and that sort of thing. This is a um, uh, kind of a, a synopsis of a workshop we often give around the state to uh, various groups uh, wanting to know more about invasive aquatic plants and what they can do about them, uh, how they might identify them sooner, and therefore make it easier to eradicate them and that sort of thing. So if you would like this type of uh, workshop given where we actually bring live plants, uh, feel free to request it. So invasive aquatic plants, what, what's the big deal? Well, there are big deals. There's both an invasive, uh, excuse me, uh, an ecosystem impact and an economic impact. From an ecosystem impact, they displace native species and they alter native ecosystems. Uh, these are actually lily pads, uh, which some people consider a nuisance, but these are actually native species. Um, the uh, non-native species, the invasive species, can crowd these out um, and crowd out a lot of other native plants that uh, ecosystems, uh, both plant and fish and other organisms need, um, uh, can do damage to them. So, um, you know, this is this ecosystem impact is a very important one. However, I think the, one of the major drivers of the invasive aquatic plant program has been citizens worry about economic impact, reduction in recreation, they can't use the lake or a pond anymore for swimming, for sailing, for that sort of thing. Uh, property values then lower and their host values lower. Tax revenues decline because of it. These sorts of things often drive the need for the type of research we're doing. Uh, interference with navigation really isn't a big deal uh, in, in Connecticut. Uh, you know, in the Mississippi River or in Florida, I'm sort of thing, it could be more of an issue. Not so much here, but uh, on a national scale. It's something that is considered. And the economic damages for, the, uh, for management of these uh, plants is tremendous. Uh, this was years ago. The number was put at $3 billion per year in uh, costs to try to manage and prevent uh, the invasive aquatic plant problems. So there are severe economic impacts. Since 2003, the Invasive Aquatic Plant Program uh, has gone about both surveys and research on solving the problem. Um, I'm going to show you the map in a minute of the lakes we've been to, but we have conducted hundreds of surveys on lakes and ponds in Connecticut. Uh, means sending a crew out with our boats um, uh, to uh, do some uh, rather sophisticated mapping. We have computers on board. 
but even with that, we still have to take rakes and throw grapples to get bottom samples to try to figure out what's there. Uh, and we take this information, digitize it, it goes into a geographic information system where then maps are developed and individual maps will look like this. Seventh the Staffordville Reservoir and Stafford Springs showing the various plants, both native and invasive, with different colors that occur throughout the lake. And then we do um, uh, these transects, usually one per 10 acre in a lake. There's 10 points per transect, and uh, they go out 80 meters from shore at 10 meter intervals. And we take plant samples on those exact points. And therefore, in the future, you can go back to those exact points get plant samples, take the same information we get, like abundance, depth, sediment type, all that, and compare um, in, uh, in a manner that can be statistically analyzed how things are changing. Here's the map of Connecticut, of the lakes we've been through, through 2019. We've done a number this year, which is not on the map. Uh, we've done 366 lake surveys, 246 different lakes. Uh, and uh, we have done 62 resurveys. That's why these numbers aren't equal. But uh, uh, in many lakes, we've resurveyed uh, many, many times. For instance, Candlewood Lake, the biggest lake in Connecticut, we've surveyed, uh, I believe, 11 times uh, consecutively in, uh, in monitoring changes there. Um, in the state, uh, lakes without an invasive species uh, the percentage are actually rather small. Um, only about 43% uh, uh, of the lakes um, have uh, no invasive species. 57% have one or more, and I think this number is going to go up a little bit this year. So well over half of our lakes have one or more invasive species, something that has come in from other parts of the world and is now um, established, in many cases a big problem. Summer is going to be going over individual species and what they look like, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here. But for instance, the most common one is Eurasian water milfoil. And again, Summer will show you what this looks like. These purple stars show you where it's located. Um, 54 lakes had this particular plant, including Lake Candlewood, uh, Lake Lomona, Lake Zor, Squance Pond. Uh, a lot of lakes in the western part of the state have this one. Uh, and then when you go to the western part of the state, you get a different type of milfoil. This variable milfoil begins to show up. It's kind of interesting that there's differences. And we've done research showing that a lot of this difference is based upon water chemistry. Whereas water in the eastern part of the state tends to be more acetic, uh, less um, alkaline than in the western part of the state. And we think that drives a lot of this. Uh, there's some. Uh, Summer's going to be talking about this later, but there's some plants which uh, are really, really great concern. One is hydrilla. This is uh, the, the most troublesome plant in Florida in some of the southern states. It has now moved into Connecticut, and we recently discovered a new strain of it that infests the entire Connecticut River. Um, and serious acreages uh, in, in, the, in the river, and we're still trying to figure out what can be done about it and learn a little bit more about that. But that's, a, that's one we're really worried about um, getting uh, into Connecticut in a, in a greater extent. Well, how do they get here? Well, they get here in a lot of ways. And as you might expect, you know, the activities of people have a lot to do with it. We think boat trailering is a big source of, veget of plants, invasive species going from lake to lake get plants on trailers, uh, people decide to go to a different lake and they don't clean the trailer and they go put the trailer in the, in the new lake and these plants will then um, uh, get into the lake and because they're in the water they can then root, create roots, float around, settle the bottom and then establish. So we think boat trailing is a, a big one. Uh, we know that the aquarium industry uh, is likely a, uh, a source most of the invasive species, like the Eurasian water milfoil I mentioned, has at one point been used as an aquarium plant. Uh, and um, as I said, most of the other ones that are in Connecticut have been uh, used as aquarium plants as well, or water gardening plants. Uh, but the aquarium industry is a funny one in that 
Um, people, they, 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 they get to have aquariums and they often get tired of them and they don't want to just dump everything out in the backyard. They want to set everything free where it might live. So they go to the nearest lake or pond and dump the aquarium. And once you do that, a lot of the plants and in some cases some fish uh, could establish. And once they're established in there, then they can begin to move around on trailers or even on wildfowl. Um, geese, for instance, can um, can move fragments on their feathers. In many cases, uh, or at least in some cases, digest seeds, which will then pass through the bird and come out the other end and then still be viable when they go to a different lake or pond and you can get um, uh, infestations that way. Now, the role of nutrients in invasive aquatic vegetation is kind of a, uh, a weird one in that you would expect that nutrients from septic systems, fertilizing, erosion would increase invasive um, plants. And that could be the case, but we, we know that some of the plants, like the variable milfoil in the eastern part of the state, actually seem to prefer low nutrient water. So it's not always that, that that's the case. Uh, we, we, we know what, when fertilizers and ethylene get into water that one of the first things you'll get is an algal bloom. And algae are different from plants. They're in the water column, they're floating around, and they actually shade out plants. So the relationship between nutrients and, and invasive aquatic plants is not well established. Uh, but again, you never want to see nutrients getting into these water bodies for at least the algae reason, if nothing else. So it's important to take measures to avoid this. Well, how do we um, control these plants once they're there? There's a lot of ways. Um, most of them are partially effective, short-term effective, but rarely are they long-term effective. Uh, but one of the first things that people often can do is just simply harvest them. This could be removing them, um, with a net or whatever, grabbing them, pulling them out with rakes. Uh, here I'm testing an underwater cutter, uh, which we were using. And you can cut them off and then collect the plants that float up, get them out of the water. And then, at least in this case, it was a beach area. Until they grow back, which they will, you have some alleviation of the problem. Uh, again, these plants, fragments of plants can set roots, these adventitious roots here, uh, off a fragment and settle to the bottom and root. So you got to worry about it. this is harvest, you know, what you're doing when you're harvesting to not create a lot of fragments. But there's mechanical harvesters, there's big machines that can harvest larger areas. Uh, again, short term fixes, not something that usually helps in the long term. Another method that's used at various lakes and ponds in the state is winter drawdown. Where you lower the lake in the winter, uh, this is Lake Bezik, and allow the vegetation to freeze, dry, whatever, and get control that way. We've done a lot of studies on this method, particularly in Lake Candlewood, where it's done every year at various levels. Uh, and we show that it works, uh, you know, at least if you draw it down deep enough, will certainly work well in, in the season that it is, the season after it is done. In other words, if it's done in the winter, the next summer, you will have a lot of alleviation, but you generally will get regrowth the following year if you don't do it again. So, um, uh, again, it's a method for uh, control, but not necessarily long-term control. And then there's aquatic herbicides. And this is something which um, is used uh, to a fairly large extent in the state. You need permits to use an herbicide. You can't just go out and put it in the lake or your pond because you want to do it. You've got to go through the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. You've got to go through their permitting uh, in order to get permission to do this. Uh, and, uh, you know, once you do that, then you can put one of a variety of, 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 of herbicides in the water. You have to post to make sure you warn people uh, what's going on. You've got to make sure people are on board uh, before you do it, or you could have some outcry. Uh, these, again, are EPA approved, environment, uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency approved. So they have gone through a pretty rigorous uh, test to make sure they're not going to harm um, uh, aquatic organisms or people. But still, 
again, when you're putting something in water and you get a lot of people uh, with homes not something around the, the lake with the water in it, you get a lot of differences of opinions and those should be worked out before you do this. But when done properly, you can get some pretty good control. And there are a fair number of lakes that have had programs going for years that have alleviated most of their invasive aquatic plant problem. But rarely do you alleviate all of it. You usually just can't walk away and say, I'm done. Next 20 years, I'm not going to have a problem. You may get a new plant. You may get regrowth of the, of the plants that were there. It's very hard to control every last little propagule. In a, in a pond or a lake, so it often will come back. But uh, these products are used, and we will occasionally do some research on them. Now, probably the gold standard for control of these invasive aquatic plants would be some sort of a biological organism that would feed specifically on the target plant, the invasive plant, and leave the native species alone. Now, this happens to be hard to do, and in fact, uh, we, at least in the early years of the program, spent a fair amount of effort on looking for uh, some sort of biological control. We ended up testing these milfoil weevils. These are insects. They're smaller than a Japanese beetle, um, quite small, and uh, they can be put in a lake or pond with Eurasian water milfoil and, uh, and feed on the milfoil. It's certainly in test tanks, they work great, but in the real world, they have not worked so well. In fact, they've worked not well at all, uh, at least in the research we've done. We had to abandon that work um, and, and move on. And right now, really the only biological method for controlling invasive species in lakes and ponds in Connecticut are these weed-eating fish called grass carp. And uh, these fish are uh, sterile. You have to buy them as a triploid form of uh, fish. And they are put in at a size of like 12 inches, maybe around 10 to 20 per vegetated acre, at a cost of $15, $20 per fish. Uh, they grow quite fast, and they'll get quite large. The first few years, it takes them a little while to grow big enough to do much. Um, damage to the, uh, to the plants, but after, after that, if you have enough of them in there, they will, they will really feed and they will uh, eat uh, the vegetation and sometimes too much uh, of the vegetation. We've done work um, with Lake Candlewood, Squans Pond, um, Ball Pond, uh, Taunton Lake, Lake Wapika in Connecticut, which all have introduced these. Uh, many times people after the first three or four years are concerned that nothing's happening only after you know four five six years to realize that most of the vegetation is gone in the pond uh, and they've gotten big enough and fed on it uh, so there's a fine line between too much control and too little control these fish will live for 10 or more years um, and then you'll have to restock they can be fished for uh, and they can be eaten um, some people might want to do that, um, but uh, obviously you're reducing your population if you, if you take them out for that purpose. Uh, so again, biological control, I think, would be the gold standard. It's just a matter that we're just not there yet. And in fact, the amount of research that I'm seeing is not great at this point. So I don't see anything in the near future uh, to get us where we want to go uh, on, on, on this issue. So I'm going to leave you now with Summer, and she's going to talk about um, the individual plants, how we identify them, uh, what they look like, a little bit about you know, uh, some lakes and ponds that have them and, and the issues. So I will end um, my part here and turn it over to Summer, and I wish you all well. Hi everyone, as Greg mentioned, uh, my name is Summer Stebbins and I am the research technician for the Invasive Aquatic Plant Program and I'm going to be teaching you about some of the plant terms that we use to identify the plants and then some of the big invasive plants that we face here in the state. So first we'll start with some reproduction terms. So these are different ways that the plants can spread. 
So we have a fragment, which is a plant part that breaks off and grows to form a genetically identical plant. So this could be an inch long, a couple inches long, really anything. But if you picture a propeller going through a patch of invasive plants, chopping it all up into tiny pieces, each one of those pieces is a fragment and can spread and sprout roots and create a new plant. You can see a picture of that here. And then the next thing is a tuber, which is a modified underground stem for starch storage and a form of vegetative reproduction. So a good example of a tuber is a potato. So these are underground roots and they can spread really far away from the main plant and that's a way that they can reproduce. And finally here we have a turion, which is a modified leaf bud on a stem or shoot which is a form of vegetative reproduction that um, is above the sediment. So we have the turions, or we have the tubers, which are underneath, and the turions, which are above. Then we have some terms for leaves. So the node is the point where leaves or branches attach to the stem. So you can see that here. So this is a node, this is a node, this is a node. Even over here, this is a node. So this is where the leaves meet the stem. And then we have three different ways that the leaves can grow. And this can be critical in identifying what plant it is. So one of the options is opposite, which we see down here. So they are two leaves that are across from each other at the same node. So you have two leaves that come off of the same point in either direction. And then we have alternate, which is one leaf per node on different sides of the stem. So here, instead of the two, it would be one coming off to the right, and then up here, one would be coming off to the left. You can see that here. So we have the left, then the right, and then the left again. So it's one leaf per node. And then we have world, which is three or more leaves at the same node forming a ring-like arrangement, as you see here. Now this can be very helpful in identifying these aquatic plants because some only have three leaves per whorl, some have four, some have eight or more. So that can be really helpful when you can count how many leaves per whorl. Some more leaf terms. So we have the leaflet, which is one of many leaf-like looking structures that when combined make one leaf. So I sort of consider it a mini leaf. So you have the, um, stalk of the leaf and then you have the little leaflets that come off so this whole thing is a leaf and then you have little leaflets coming off and then you have the petiole which is a leaf stalk and that's basically the distance between the node and where the leaf starts some plants have petioles some plants don't that could be helpful in identification so if you don't see the petiole this leaf would be right up against the node against the stem of the plant but this petiole is the leaf stalk or the stem of the leaf. And then we have a rosette, which is a cluster of leaves that surround the stem at the same point. It's like a whorl, but it's very, very intense and it is not repeated further along in the plant. It's just this one point. And then we have a tooth or teeth, which are the sharp points along the leaf margin. This can also be helpful in identification because some leaves have teeth, some leaves don't, and then even the shape of the teeth can be helpful. So now we're gonna get into the different invasive species. So this first one is fanwort or Cabamba caroliniana, and it is this bright green color. It's usually introduced through aquariums because it's so pretty and people like having it. So this has the opposite leaves that we talked about. So you have the node here and then a leaf on either side and it has long petioles. That's very important with fanwort. There's a state listed species, which means it's protected by the state of Connecticut. That looks very similar to fanwort with the main difference is that it does not have a petiole. So the leaf comes directly from the stem. So when looking for fanwort, you always wanna look for the petiole and then fanwort gets its name from the fanned out leaf shape that it gets, as you can see in these images. Another one we have is Brazilian waterweed, or Agaria densa, and this is a very bushy plant, and it has four leaves per whorl, and then when it flowers, it has these pretty white flowers with three leaves and a yellow center, and it's another one that's commonly introduced through the aquarium trade because it is very pretty and makes your aquariums look nice. We'll be coming back to this one in a moment. 
And then we have hydrilla, hydrilla verticillata. This is the big bad one, it might be the worst. So you can see it here, don't pay attention to this, this will come up later on, but here you have this hydrilla that's matted at the surface. It's long and green and bushy, and it can spread almost any way you can imagine. It spreads through tubers, it spreads through turions, it has winter buds, it also spreads through fragmentation. So it does its very best to spread and take over everywhere. Generally, it has five leaves to a whorl, but we've done some research in the Connecticut River and the species of hydrilla there has eight or more leaves to a whorl, so it can be really intense. And this is actually a picture from the Connecticut River. And we've been doing a lot of work trying to map out the hydrilla in the Connecticut River and figure out how much is there and any potential management options that may be possible. So this is a helpful chart for the commonly confused species because if you remember the Brazilian waterweed and the hydrilla look rather similar to each other. And then you have Elodea in the middle, which is just a native waterweed. So the native waterweeds are much smaller. They only have three leaves per whorl and they're very easy to manage and they're native. Now the Brazilian waterweed gets a little bit bigger and it has whorls of four. And then hydrilla has whorls or five or more as we've seen in the Connecticut River. And the saying goes, the more leaves to a whorl, the worse it gets. So when you're out on a lake or pond, make sure you always check with a species that looks like this, whether it has three leaves to a whorl or more. If it has more, it could be an invasive and it's important to report that to us. Another invasive species is common water hyacinth. This Latin name is always fun to say, it's Icornia crassipus. And this one is actually not banned in the state. You're allowed to sell it, you're allowed to have it, and that is because it has yet to overwinter. As of right now, every time it, it gets established in a water body, it dies over the winter because it cannot withstand the freezing temperatures. This one has these inflated petioles. Remember the petiole is the leaf stalk, and that is inflated here. This is a cross section of it, and you can see all the starch that's inside. It has this bright green leaf and it floats at the surface with these gorgeous purple flowers, which is why people like it so much. But underneath it has these black roots that mat together at the surface underneath the plants and it can get pretty gnarly in there. It mats up real big and algae gets in there, bugs get in there. It can be a bit problematic. And this plant reproduces very quickly. It can double in size in as little as seven days. And so if you had one plant, you'd have two plants in seven days and so on and so forth. So it can take over pretty quickly. Thank goodness it doesn't overwinter here, but down in Florida, they have some major problems with this clogging up canals and other waterways. This one's usually pretty, pretty easy to identify. This is European water clover, Marsilia quadrifolia. And just as its name, water clover, it looks like a four leaf clover. We don't see this too often in the state. We have three markings up here for three different water bodies, but it does uh, cover the surface when it grows and it can even grow outside of the water. So you'll see the stalks that come up out of the water. Now we have three milfoil species in here. This is parrot feather, Myriophyllum aquaticum. And this one looks very different from the other two. You can tell it has these bright red stems, that's an easy way to tell, and its leaf tops outside of the water look almost plasticky. They're very soft and feathery, that's where it gets its name. It's this bright, bright green color, and it generally has whorls of five or six, and this is what the leaf shape looks like. It has some leaflet pairs here, and it can really take over, as shown in this picture. Variable water milfoil or Myriophyllum heterophyllum is a common one we see in the state, as you can see based on all these stars. And this one looks very similar to the next milfoil I'm going to show you, but I have a slide that'll break that down. So the variable water milfoil is very thick. It's very difficult to see the stem because there are so many leaves taking it up. And they have these thick flowers that come on the surface of the water and that's a pretty easy way to identify it if it is flowering. It has four leaves per whorl and the leaflets, there are not that many of them. There's less than 11 pairs and then the leaf has a more triangular shape than other milfoils. 
to me it kind of looks like octopus tentacles under the water um, they're very thick looking or maybe like a huge pipe cleaner um, that's sort of what to look for and then we have eurasian watermill foil myriophyllum spicatum this one looks pretty similar to the variable but it is different uh, you can see there's a greater space between the whorls here so you can actually see the stem it's bright white stem and some the stem can be white or green it depends and then it has a rectangular leaf with many more leaflet pairs it has 12 or more leaflet pairs and this one we also find very often but more towards the west uh, western side of the state where the variable is more commonly on this side of this on the eastern side i can So here we have the Myriophyllum spicatum, the Eurasian water milfoil, and then on the right we have the variable water milfoil, the Myriophyllum heterophyllum. So as you can see, we have the differences here. So the Eurasian water milfoil has a very thin flower, where the variable has a very thick and bushy flower. And then on the Eurasian water milfoil, the leaves are an inch apart, so you can see the stem very clearly where in the variable water mill foil it's very bushy and everything is very close together less than an inch apart then with eurasian water mill foil we have 12 or more pairs of leaflets per leaf so it's very very many leaflets where there's much less with the variable water mill foil 11 pairs or less and then with the eurasian water mill foil you have a rectangular leaf and the variable you have a triangular leaf we have a guide on our website that has this broken down, so it's very easy to see the differences between the two. Another invasive species we find is minor naiad, or nias minor, and it's a smaller one. It usually does not grow too tall, and you'll only find it in shallow waters. It's rarely a problem. We don't often treat for it, but it is this crunchy plant. It's very hard. When you feel it in your hands, you can sort of crunch it, and it has these toothed leaf edges that's an easy way to identify it and it can grow this dark green or a beige this is a lighter green color it usually ranges between beige and dark green but once you grab it, it's very brittle another common name for it is brittle water nymph and that's because when you feel it you can crunch it in your hands our next invasive aquatic plant is curly leaf pondweed potamogeton crispus there are many Potamogetons, most of them are native, but uh, this is the invasive pondweed, and we call it the lasagna plant because the leaves look like lasagna noodles. You can see that they ripple here, and we have an herbarium mound here to sort of show you what it looks like, and this is a turion, which is one of the methods of reproduction. So the last plant we have for you today is water chestnut or trapanatans, and it is pretty easily recognizable by this rosette. So these are leaves that come to the surface of the water, and you can, when it flowers, you have these white flowers that are in the middle of it. Now this plant, it can grow a lot, but it's an annual, so it actually is one of the easier invasive species to manage because you do not have to use chemicals or any of the other management methods. You can simply pluck it out and take it out, but before it drops seeds. These are the seeds here, these brown nutlets, and they have these very sharp edges. It is not fun to step on one of these for sure. But if you let one of these rosettes go to seed and it drops this seed, this seed can reside in the sediment for up to 10 years, maybe more. And once it does sprout, it can produce roughly seven rosettes, maybe more, and the rosette itself can produce around 10 seeds. So if you let one of these seeds um, grow, then you can potentially face a huge problem because it will create so many more seeds from the rosettes. So it's very important to hand pull it as soon as you see it and make sure that you get all the seeds as possible. You try to grab as low uh, towards the root system as possible. If you can get the whole thing, great. If not, as long as you break down below where all the rosettes are, you should be pretty fine. But this plant, if you recognize it from the hydrilla picture, 
It is also in the Connecticut River, and the Connecticut River Conservancy does a lot of work with volunteers hand pulling this stuff to try to manage it and keep the river accessible for kayakers, paddlers, and also the environment and the animals. So that's all we have for today. And if you have any questions, you can contact Greg or I. Uh, these are our email addresses and our office phone numbers. And we are from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station and Face of Aquatic Plant Program. Feel free to go to our website. We have all of our survey data, all of our herbarium mounts. We have a lot of data for people to look at and play around with and really learn about all the different invasive aquatic plants in the state and ways that we control them and ways that we prevent them from getting in. And so please check it out and feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you.